Oh, I had it for two hours, so it'll go, okay. because I'm not sure how to say good afternoon in Anuktut, but uh, so I say Ublami is good morning. So um, just welcome to National Indigenous Peoples Day and taking part in uh, this incredible printmaking workshop led by Laura Greer and co-hosted with Lillian Rose. And so it's been uh, we just finished doing a drawn to nature that was that went really well. It was a sharing of artistic practice and story sharing. It's a beautiful day today, and so um, we're going to be doing some uh, plant-based printmaking. And I uh, just want I'm just going to keep letting people in. So um, what we'll do is if uh, because there are so far 36 people with us today. Um, from, it would be nice to hear where you're from in the chat. We're going to have everybody on mute and kind of let Lillian and Laura lead the conversation. But of course, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat and then I can share them out. If you want to share any little introspections or, or um, all that kind of stuff, I'm happy. That's been uh, really nice to kind of see where people are from and how they're engaging with the workshop. But uh, other than that, I'm just really happy to uh, be with you here today. So I'll hand it over to uh, Laura. Hi everyone. Can you hear me very well? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. I am joining you all the way from Toronto where it is supposed to feel like plus 38. So very hot. <laughs> but um, thank you very much for joining us. I would like to thank Vanessa for inviting me to help do some fun little workshop with you folks, as well as Lillian. Lillian's going to show you some really cool dyeing stuff that you can do at home. And um, yeah, so my name is Laura Greer. I am a printmaker based out of Alberta, but I am currently. I just finished my master's in fine art at OCAD University and I just graduated and we had a virtual conversation. So online mm -hmm. the way of the future. Um, I am Dene, I am Sakti Dene from the Northwest Territory and I am currently um, yeah just really happy to be here. Um, so I'm just going to show you a little bit of like what materials I have here with me. And then I can start showing you folks what I have in mind. Um, so this, this website is called like the Mystic Traces. It kind of stems from this idea that uh, we're all at home right now. So what do we have that we can use to do our work as a printmaker? Um, printmaking is very accessible. Like you don't always need an institution and a fancy press to be able to do some work. And um, it's one of my favorite parts about printmaking. So I'm going to shift the 
uh, camera so you can see my spread right here and we'll get started. So, um, because I'm in an urban setting, I have a lot of very nice planted uh, florals from people's gardens or, my, or the garden here. But I also was harvesting from this bouquet that my partner gave me. And it was just wilting and dying. So I'm like, oh, perfect, I can use it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All I have here is just, I use some scissors and I cut off little tiny leaves from the bouquet. And I also took some leaves from my front yard. And I also, you can use almost any material that you think will make a mark. So any type of DIY print that you can find on the internet will give you so many different ideas of the things that you can find at home to create marks that you can use for either posters, uh, print like uh, cards, pillowcases, fabric, anything that you can use, it's really thin material that you can use. And so I make shift, I want to test this out. It's a bathroom roll wrapped in some twine. And I'm really interested to see dipping it in the paint to see what kind of marks might happen. We'll find out. Um, to make a, a fairly good press and push, um, 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 Sometimes, Laura, if you have Laura, different... Uh, sometimes if there's more than one, um, if there's one more than one computer or technical device that's uh, watching it, that's creating that. Okay. Is it sound all right, though? That sounds better. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Okay. So continue. We have a little roller baking. Uh, very lightly, you can press any type of painted or inked uh, flower or plant. So you don't need all that much pressure to make a really good imp impression with this print making technique. Sometimes you can also use a wooden spoon, depending on if you have a really hard material like plastic, um, you can rub it. Uh, you can use really simple paintbrushes that you can find. I just went to dollar store and I stocked up on some of my paintbrushes. But I also found this at the hardware store, really cheap. This is only a few dollars for some sponge rollers. And this works just as fine as any other type of roller. So this is what I have. I have a whole bunch of uh, just loose paper to do, to print on, to paint the materials on, and I have a whole bunch of variety of things that I want to test print with. So you can use even a, a t-shirt. You can use old pillowcases, old linen to print with. And I have brought some hides that I uh, brought back from home from Alberta. I have this to test on. I really want to try and see what kind of marks come from there. And then I have some really nice papers and doilies. 
I found this at the dollar store. And I also found this at the dollar store. It's just a really simple tote bag. And this should be able to make a mark or a pattern. A pattern is ideal. You're not going to get as much detail as a nice paper print from the plant, but you can get some really nice patterns with it. Okay. So, how's everyone feeling? Does everyone have materials and ready to go? I see a lot of ready faces, Laura, so I think we're good. Amazing. So I have also just some drawing paper for my sketchbook. It tends to be just a little bit more heavy weight than computer loose leaf paper. So this is really good to do your first prints on. And you can also do some test prints with your loose leaf paper, which is what I am going to do. So I'm going to lay a piece of paper down. I have this table covered. I can get ink all over it, but I can use this as my inking up paper. And I'm just going to pick whatever I want from my nice pile, maybe these two. And this is really simple acrylic ink. You can also use fabric ink, which is, works really well, obviously, with fabric. And you can use a hairdryer to make sure that that sticks to the fabric and you can rewash it. So I'm going to either use this roller first and I'm going to demonstrate painting it on as well. Maybe I could um, join you, Laura. Okay, um, just a question. I'm, I'm coming to you all from the west side of the Rockies, um, situated in the Rocky Mountain Trench, um, a Kiskanook First Nation, and um, so happy to be here with all of you across Canada, and especially you, Laura, and congratulations to you. And I'm just glad to be a part of today's session. And in my quest and love of learning especially indigenous um, plants. Um, I have a, a bit of a forestry background and spent years working in the Forest Service and found it a wonderful opportunity to learn about indigenous plants. And I've gone off on a bit of a tangent um, with eco dyeing and the colors that um, indigenous people were able to extract from indigenous plants. And so today, Laura and I are going to um, just talk about um, simple ways that we can do it, but also bringing in the indigenous perspective of what plants um, we, we used in the extraction of um, color and how we introduce that color into our lives, whether it was on hides or through beading, um, through quill work, and um, the latest trend we have is eco dyeing. And so I have some samples that I'll show a little bit later as you guys are um, um, finishing off. So at any time, um, I believe uh, Renata is the moderator for the event and I will go ahead and turn you back to Laura and enjoy your printmaking. Thank you so much, Lillian. We're gonna be able to learn a lot more about some of the plants that are near us. And I think that that's some great insights because that's one of the sad things about living in an urban area is that it's very, you have to really search for some plants that you really want. Okay, so I have just done two different techniques. I've used this little sponge roller and I laid a bunch of paint right here. And I just kept rolling it, and I very delicately rolled this leaf with it. And with this one, I just used the, the simple brush, and I lightly, very lightly tried to paint this leaf. I find that if it's, if it's too gunky, it's going to look very gunky. So 
So sometimes even a test proof will help you get a nicer print, depending on if you have to get the hang of it. Sometimes it'll just be really gunky, and then you have to do another piece of paper for it to be a little bit more clear. So I'm going to move these onto a fresh sheet of paper because I don't really want to print onto your painting paper. And I'm going to grab my drawing paper. And what I'm going to do is just press this paper directly onto the plant, very delicately. And when you get the piece of paper on, you're just going to hold it with your hand so it doesn't shift. So, very nice and delicately. And I'm going to use my little baking roller. We're going to bake a print. You can just do it very lightly. Hold it. You can do it sideways. Really depends on your plant because some of these plant, plants that I got from outside were baking in the sun and they're very light. So we'll find out. So it that should be okay. And then I flip it, I flip it over and I peel off the backing and I carefully lift the leaves from the back. And so here you go. It sometimes depends on your paint. Sometimes, you know, I went to the dollar store and it's a, you have to play with your paint, whether you have to add water if it's too thick or if it's too thick, you're going to have to add components to it. Sometimes glue will help, but great. Uh, I'm going to do some more test printing with the different types of leaves that I have here to see what kind of marks that I really want to print onto uh, the t-shirt or the hide or do the different types of material that's harder to print with paper. And while I am inking them up, um, maybe Lillian, you want to talk about some of the plants and the colors mm -hmm. that can come with this? I would love to. Um, I was in, in my travels last summer. Um, I spent a lot of time collecting different plants. Um, and so we're just getting into the growing season here. And so what I'm doing now is I, everywhere I look, I'm looking for um, plants that I can process, I can collect and harvest and process and put aside because I find that um, you have to, if you're going to be doing the eco dyeing with indigenous plants, you need to be in tune with the seasons in which they um, um, become ready and when the colors and dyes that you extract for them are at their most potent. So I have had the wonderful pleasure of meeting a lot of people who have become addicted to printmaking and especially eco dyeing and what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to move my camera and show you um, a couple of the prints that are coming out of some workshops just using things like leaves from maple trees um, from onion skins in your kitchen I think one of my favorite plants is the elderberry they it produces the one of the most beautiful um, almost indigo blue to black um, in eco dyeing. And I've just been using um, water, just the very basic of watercolor paper. And I'll just show you some of the prints that have been produced by, oh, I'm not sure how I'm gonna do this. I might have to do it this way. But, um, so this is a 
print that's made up using very simple plants, um, texture. Um, the very dark rusty is actually just onion skins from your regular white onions. They give off an incredible potent dye color. Um, the elderberry plant, you can see how you can get this beautiful um, blue along with the sage green. In the eco dyeing process, there's things that are called mordants, um, iron and copper. And so iron tends to make your colors a little bit darker and deeper, whereas the copper tends to brighten them. So um, again, this is with a copper. The paper is painted with a copper. I mean, uh, uh, this one is an iron. And what it does, it just intensifies all of the rust colors. And this again is just onion skin on watercolor paper. And um, one of the other plants that isn't indigenous to Canada, but it is eucalyptus. And it leaves one, because of the variety, they have great form. And what happens is that, so rather than actually um, printing, we're, we're getting a lot of texture as well. So I love um, using watercolor paper. Some of my most favorite indigenous plants to use are um, the Oregon grape plant. And it's really quite unique in the fact that you've got bright dark blue berries on the plant. And then when you take out the roots and you um, extract the bark, you get an incredibly bright yellow. So we have that very um, interesting plant where you can eat the berries, but you can also use the berries to extract dye, a lovely blue dye. And then the bark, you get a bright, bright yellow. So one plant produces food as well as um, dyes for um, the art that Indigenous people um, were involved in. And so that's probably my number one. Um, barks are also really important. Um, one of my favorite is cedar bark. And when you let the cedar um, steep in water, it produces one of the most richest, um, amazing colors to use in eco dyeing. So that's another fairly common, depends on where you live. Um, the east is going to have lots of maples and the leaves um, from the maple trees provide beautiful color and pattern as well. I'll turn it back over to you as, um, to you, Laura. Hey, one question, oh, sorry. One question that came up was, how do you apply the mordants? Um, the mordants are liquids. So what you do is, I've just got large mason jars and you can get copper pipe and you just stick it in the jar and you let it sit. And the copper just sort of mixes in with the water. With the iron, it's the rusty stuff. You get rusty nails and you stick them in a jar and you just let it sit. And um, then you take, screen it, and then you just use the water and you just brush your watercolor paper with it. And then you put your leaves down and press it and then steam it. So the interaction of the mordant and the steam um, produces texture and these beautiful colors on paper. Just, just. It's so beautiful and so like printing. It's it's stunning. Okay. So I'll turn that back over to you, Laura. Great. So I just painted up some new ones. I'm going to have a vote, maybe. Do you folks want to see this really large t-shirt or the tie, or do you really want both? Do an online poll. 
So right. the hide or the t-shirt? So far we have a hide, both, hide, Hide. Hide. So I think we know. <laughs> okay, I guess we're going to test some of the hide. Woo! Okay, I'm going to squish it a bit together more. It's very tiny. I'm very excited to use this. I need the fresh one because it's so goopy. I really like the use of the, I don't know if it's intentional, but the negative space as well with the plant. So the, that you have with the pink fern. Yeah. Okay, let's see what this. Let's see what happens. So I'm just going to flop it on. And look for the best. Great, so I'm going to hold it in place. Use my little, we'll bake some up, some, some sort of sprint here. <laughs> so, Renata, mm -hmm. or just joining in, um, in the past, um, one of the more colorful objects that um, Indigenous had, people had were their parfletches. And so in many um, museums and collections, you will find these wonderfully patterned, I call them suitcases, because in essence, they were used to carry and store. And so there are some beautiful examples of how natural colors have been extracted, whether it's ochre, um, the Oregon grape, or, um, um, one of the very few plants that can produce a bright red is called strawberry blight. And so you're able to get that true dark um, red, plus all of the berries that produce it. So they were able to make um, some great colors um, out of those natural pigments. And they would use that to decorate and embellish um, their parfletches. Yes, yes. Daryl uh, Kootenai in our previous, he was sharing that he does parflesh bags and that material just really does suit itself well to, to uh, dyes and designs. That looks so beautiful. Okay, yeah, we're just going to peel off the leaves. So I use a lot more pressure because it hides. <laughs> it's not going to squish as much. It's going to kind of absorb a lot more. So you probably need like a lot more ink. And because it was baking in the sun, it's very thin leaf. Very delicately but quickly. <laughs> Here we go. I can certainly post more photos of these in person if folks want to see that. But it works quite well. And you can let it dry. It will dry very quickly. You can also again use the hair dryer and that just ensure that it will be baked onto the material. I love it. So fun. And could you do like a, cause it, you know, could you do like another color on top of that that would uh, allow a little bit more texture once it dried? Is that a possible with printing? For sure. Yep. And because you're using normally very simple water-based paint or ink or block, block ink, it dries very quickly. It should dry within even like 10 minutes. Okay. So if I leave this behind me, it could even try and bake or I could try and bake, I could try and put another color. 
it's just not going to layer as you would think it would layer if it was on paper. Yeah. Um, it could, it'll end up muddying a little, but that's fine. Totally fine. Yeah. We've gotten a couple of questions. Um, Feel free to send them my way. The questions are, they might be for Lillian. Uh, have you used tamarack bark? Maybe that's for both of you. As a form of dye or as a, as a texture? Um, I haven't used tamarack, but I have used um, cedar. And also we have a lovely tree species here called white bark pine and they've got beautiful texture. Um, I haven't used it to extract color, but I know for sure that birch bark and cedar produce a beautiful um, color. Nice. And then how do you steam the paper and plants when using mordant? Um, I usually, there's, there's a whole bunch of ways in which you do it. Um, if you, the whole focus of this is, you know, printmaking from your home, things that you might just have readily available. So there's a couple ways. I steam because I find that I love the intensity that the steam produces, but you can easily just wrap your um, watercolor paper in saran wrap and stick it in your microwave for a few minutes and oh, then nice. let it cool. So there's very quick ways to do it and then there's the, some of the longer traditional ways. And it's just a matter of experimenting, um, but heat is a required process, whether it's microwave heat or heat through the steaming process. Like steaming through an iron or steaming through oh, a boiling no. water? Oh, you just gave me an idea. I'm going to have to try my iron. <laughs> um, I usually do um, a hot water bath and then elevate the, the watercolor paper and sometimes even submerge the watercolor paper in, in the water and steam it. I'm, I've only been doing it for about 45 minutes, normally just because that's usually the time frame that I have. So some people do it longer and I find that it's, it's like cooking. Mm. There's a basic recipe and then people just add their own um, unique little secret spices or secret processes. But um, the one thing I love is that you start, like even today, you start out with all of the same materials and yet the results of it are just so amazingly different and unique. Yeah, that's true. I'm not sure. It, yeah, so that was my question. There's lots of information um, available on the eco dyeing process and um, it's a little bit um, like I said everyone has their own special recipe but if you can just kind of condense down some of the most basic steps and then just experiment away it's it's an amazing process it's a it's like Christmas every time I unwrap um, any of the eco dye papers. Hey. Okay. Uh, I'm actually going to use this old pillow case instead of the t-shirt. It's very soft, so I'm actually very excited. So old, <laughs> so it's very, very soft. So I'm going to see what this looks like by printing it onto some cherry. Look, very delicate. Um, fabric. And what you can do is that you can just very lightly move everything out of the way. <laughs> you have enough room. But I'm just going to carefully Lay the pillowcase on top of the plant. And then I'm going to firmly press down so they don't shift. Grab my roller and just very lightly 
you can definitely feel the plant. So it's very fun. Oh, I like this. I'm kind of have things everywhere. Okay, we'll find out. <laughs> and I'm going to just try and grab the paper that the backing, just flip the pillowcase back over, remove the backing, this also looks really pretty. <laughs> Beautiful. So this actually came with quite a lot of detail. Again, I can take photos of these a lot better, but because it is such a nice light um, fabric, it seems to really handle the ink really well with the with the plant. So this is really great for if you want to use masks or if you don't want to invest into new pillowcases like um, you can make your own patterns and your own designs and then use a hair dryer and you can throw it in the wash a few times well you don't want to wash it over and over and over but this is reusable once you bake it on with a hair dryer okay we were having one in one of our previous chats we were kind of looking at how when you use natural dyes how um like what are the good kind of mixes that you can do so that it can adhere to like material so um when you have paints they kind of pre they kind of um they kind of stick to the fabric because they already have that adhesive so when you're working with natural materials what kind of um adhesive material do you use so that it could also have that that same kind of stick. Um, I would say one of my ex in my experiences, um, I've been working with cotton and with linen, and um, with paper. And so watercolor paper has various amounts of cotton and linen in them. And I found that. Um, thing with the natural dyes because there if you use the morgan there's a there's a um, scientific reaction that happens and so it bonds to to most things so i think that um the mordants help to um bring the color either to i always call it happy and sad iron makes the color sad and the um, the copper makes your your colors happy and so the mordant's important in you know taking your color in a direction it might be the same onion skin but in an iron mordant it becomes sad and in a copper it becomes brighter and lighter and then it's interaction and so unfortunately I don't have all the science down pat but when things do work it's a wonderful thing I'm not sure if that answered the question there, Renalta. It, it did a little bit. I mean, I love mm -hmm. how natural materials interact with natural and natural material and then the, mm -hmm. the relationship that 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 changes it because mm -hmm. it, it is, um, you know, when we look at uh, like, say we, you know, we dye materials and dye porcupine quills and we're able to kind of dye those natural materials in, in, in ways. Mm -hmm. But when we're looking at it from a visual art perspective, sometimes that that color doesn't transfer as well, or it doesn't have that stay that it needs to have. And so, mm -hmm. um, just kind of going like, if you were harvesting your own colors and you wanted to mm -hmm. use printing, what would be some of that um, 
adhesive material that allows it to have that, that stay. Mm -hmm. um, I do know traditionally that um, bear grease always worked. I, I've done lots of um, work in the field of archaeology. And so when you come across um, pictographs that have been there for time immemorial, um, you know, you wonder, well, how does, how did, how does that, why does it have that lost, lasting impression? And so they would, in particular with pictographs, um, the iron ochres, um, and we live in an area where we have a wonderful um, source of material that was used by the Stony and the Nakoda, the Tanaka, and that's the paint pots that are located in Kootenai National Park. Um, that is one source of um, a place where you're getting the pigment and it has been commercially harvested. It, the color was um, was um, extracted in and used in the coloring of bricks and apparently there was a, a commercial component to the paint pots at one point in time but traditionally that's where Indigenous people in this particular part of the world would go to extract um, the pigment and then using in the use on par flashes, it was some kind of uh, grease of some sort, whether it was bare fat or that. And so every time I see a pictograph, I'm reminded of how they had that knowledge. And um, as, you know, as a contemporary Indigenous people and artists, um, there is research that we need to conduct to, to find out the staying power. So, you know, combining Western science and indigenous thing is, uh, indigenous knowledge is, um, is a wonderful place to be because we have so much knowledge and how we then translate that to people and artists in a contemporary setting is still, I think, a very young work. And so I'm glad to, to be a part of that. Thank you. That's Yeah, I never thought about that in the form of pictographs. So it is that longevity of, of it is it is science, but it's not it's not um, explored Western science perspective, but an indigenous science perspective, which is of course. We have a couple questions. Um, we have, Laura, do you get a better impression placing the fabric paper hide on top of the leaf rather than placing leaves on top of the fabric and rolling that way? Um, you can, you just have to, you can do both, so that you can lay your fabric down and place whatever pattern of leaves that you want. And as long as you have a good set of like uh, thick paper or even just any type of backing. You just place it on top and then you roll. You just need the backing to be able to roll it and you should be able to get that the pattern without you having to put it on the bottom. You can put it on the top as well. So I tested that weird makeshift I love it. Paper roll and we're able to make some really fun lines. Really simple. Really fun. But, yeah. And then we just have one. Um, I'm surprised that some of my choices for imprint aren't that successful. The more three-dimensional the choice, the less successful it is. Flatter choices are working more successfully. Thank you for the information regarding it. Flatter material, so if you have a lot of really flowery, sticking out material, you will have to use very flat material. Okay. I'm going to try to use what I just heard. This is dry enough already, and I can place an already inked up leaf. And the clean backing, hopefully. <laughs> and you just lightly roll that on. Okay. 
peel back the back name. There you go. You can print directly. You can keep layering. I find that um, if anyone has access to gloss printing ink, gloss, that tends to be quite dry as it, and it works decently for layering because it's so dry. Whereas acrylic could, it doesn't quite, it soaks too much because it has a little bit more too, too much water. But fabric acrylic ink is also the same concept. That looks really nice, that layering on the leather. Yeah. And I'm going to one more thing. This tote bag. I don't know how I should have picked the hot pink. But I can also do the same thing as long as I have backing. I'm going to place an ink up leaf wherever I want. I don't know. Because this one has a big stem on it, I'm going to rip it off. Grab some loose paper and okay. This is a very strange type bag. The material is very plasticky. You're going to have such a better time if you have nice fabric tote bags or if you make some yourself. I'm a little bit harder because I'm not sure how well it's going to show up because it's so dark. Yeah, I had to. You can also use your hands because I know that this has quite a bit of ink on it. I can use this fancy spoon if you want. You can use your hands too. I really like these makeshift items you have, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. I don't actually beg. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I baked, but <laughs> I can cook. I can't bake though. So. We use the back of the by the way. You can always like sneak under. As long as you hold that leaf down in its place. This one's really quite hard. You can tell it's very water deprived. So that's similar to what you brought up Clarice, which is that the flatter choices are working more successfully than the, than the three dimensional ones, which are kind of surprising because you would think that they would add more Okay, so it worked decently enough. I can't see that much detail because it's black fabric. But I think that's what the great thing is about some of the leaves you have in urban areas is they're very like big, thick, like shaped, very specifically shaped leaves. And I think that that's really useful for just simple pattern making. So like I could place this all over this bag and it'll look really great. And yeah. it's a recycle bag. <laughs> <laughs> so leave recycle. 
Okay, so I believe that's what I have for you today. You can feel free to like leave some like some questions for us. We have a little bit of time before we go. Does anyone have any questions or um, uh, when you have any questions? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Renalta? Yes. Is there any chance we could have the participants give us a quick look of what they've made? Yes, I would love that. Oh, yes, I should. Thank you for the prompt, Lillian. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you have a, a note, but in the top left hand, um, this is re being recorded. And we're recording it for yourself if you're interested in reviewing some of the techniques that you've seen. And as you keep working, you might go, oh, what was that process again? Or what was Lillian sharing with us again? So that you can kind of go back and review that. And, uh, and also, um, it would be nice to, I know that this is only a part of the process. More often, we never complete art in an hour. So if you feel like you uh, want to, it'd be nice to um, have everyone show their work and we'll just take a nice big picture and say like, thank you for joining us on National Indigenous Peoples Day. I'll go to gallery view. Oh, look at these beautiful. Let's see. Oh, this. lovely. Oh, oh, these look so good. Oh, I love those leaves. Oh, that looks so good. Okay. Let's see. And then I'll like it. Oh, I love the feathers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Indigenous people day. Oh, can we put up the. Uh, Let's put them up one more time. Just one second. And happy National Indigenous Peoples Day! <laughs> they look really beautiful. Really beautiful. And I like seeing everyone's workstations too. That's so nice. <laughs> so, um, we don't, we're not going to end the, the, the workshop for you. We're going to do like a nice little leave when you want. Laura and Lily and I are going to be the hosts. If you have any questions or sharings, um, feel free just to uh, uh, turn on your volume. We have people here from Montreal, from New Brunswick, from Canmore, from Lillooet, from Vancouver, from Nanaimo from Calgary and just want to say thank you to everyone that's taken the time to join us today. It's just, it's really special. So really appreciative. Yeah. Thank you. I'm really excited to do this. It was really fun. Thank you everyone. That was a lot of fun. You'll never have to go to Hallmark again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Laura, your deck looks so nice. Yeah. Um, my partner's mom likes to do the deck at the whole lunch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, really beautiful. So what's your plan for the rest of the day, Lillian and Laura? Well, I am looking outside. Usually um, we are in celebration, usually with all of our relatives and our family uh, from our various communities, but because of the COVID, um, all of those events have been canceled. So it's a bit of an unusual day for us because we're usually 
um, dancing and drumming and singing and celebrating. And today's a rather quiet day, so we're just going to spend it with some family. And um, but now I'm thinking, I think I need to go do some art. Yeah, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> inspired. Fun. Yes, uh, yes, definitely. It, One it, of us. Uh, we have a wonderful question. I'm not sure if Luana's still here, but she asked, "Can if wild rhubarb is used for anything?" Wild rhubarb. Great, great crack. Rhubarb crack. Oh, rhubarb crisp. <laughs> I'm not sure, but they're great leaves. If you want um, a, a good leaf to use that that is um, it is toxic um, to animals and things like that but um, it was definitely a food source I'm not so sure I've never tried to get color from it but it does have a red pigment to it so I'm not sure I might have to experiment with that hmm. yeah I just got um, I, was, I was like oh yeah it sucks I had a, a dental procedure done on Thursday, so my face is really swollen, and I think it's going to get worse, so I put tons of makeup on it to cover it up. Oh, is it an abscess, or? No, no, it's, um, I'm getting a tooth replaced, and so they just had to do something to, oh. to uh, get it ready for them. Mm -hmm. But they were like, oh, yeah, you can drive home after. You won't have any trouble. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's, no. It was intense. <laughs> So um, how many people do you still have online, Renata? We have 19 participants online. And uh, we usually kind of just let it go uh, maybe like five or 10 minutes over. Oh, okay, yeah. So, yeah. so I know that with COVID, things are not usual. So I'm really excited to see how the BAMP Center responds to this and having this type of event. Um, I, I, I can hardly wait to see how things will transpire and how things will um, become um, more digital and virtual. Yes. Well, this was the first one that's gone all online. So we're the mm -hmm. we're leading the way at BAM Center with the National Indigenous Peoples Day programming. Mm -hmm. We have, um, after this is done, we have you could watch all the films. We have these mm -hmm. are films by the Stony Nakota AV Club that, uh, and uh, Jules Kusach and Osa Squatch you. So you can watch those all week, uh, anytime mm -hmm. you want. And one of the, Stony Nakota did a PSA for COVID in their community, which I just really love. It's like a form. <laughs> you can watch it from wherever. And then okay. uh, Tom Jackson's gonna be performing at four o'clock this afternoon. It, is he in his home doing that or is I he at the so. yeah, No, I think so. He's, he hosts himself, he said, and uh, he's going to be sharing like stories and uh, just being his charismatic, great, mm -hmm. he's such a great uh, performer, so his charismatic self. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to end with Derek Kootenay that's going to be doing a closing like you did our welcoming. So it's mm -hmm. really great. nice. Us if they could watch it later. Yes. Workshop will be online on our YouTube. Oh, it's hot. Oh. Everywhere. Mm. Which is really great about most of this water ink is that it's you get on your clothes, just throw it in the wash later. It'll come off. Yeah, you don't have to worry about it too too much. Yeah, that that the hide is it takes that uh, paint really, really well. Yeah. I'll send you some photos here. Hey. Uh, someone was sharing that it was really nice information to hear about natural pigments. It's a bonus to the workshop. Yeah. 
yeah, I'm, I'm really excited because like I said, this is the start of my harvesting period. And so I'm just, every time I look at something, I'm thinking, oh, that's coming home with me. And so as berries ripen, I'm really excited because there's some berries that we use as food. And I'm, so I'm going to experiment with them. Um, Supalali, um, kabata in Tanaka, um, they have, they're bright yellow, they're bright orange. And so I'm going to work with those um, in about a couple weeks, as soon as they ripen. So I'm excited about that. And um, just trying, but I have to say elderberry is my favorite so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that if there's not any more questions or anything, I think we'll end the workshop and just say thank you, Kuyanik Masicho, for uh, joining us this afternoon and check out the rest of our events. Uh, and the day and and also and go outside and enjoy some of the plant life that uh, we in, we interacted with this morning. So okay, my okay. granddaughter has something to say to everyone. Ah, oh! happy National Indigenous Day. Happy National and Indigenous Day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So she's dancing, so we're going to go find ourselves somewhere to have our own little party here. Wonderful. Wonderful. And, yeah, and happy Father's Day to all those wonderful fathers out there. Mm -hmm. in heaven. Yes, my, my dad is not with us. and Mom. Yeah, so we're going to just go have a little um, a quiet time, and then we're going to go and celebrate. Beautiful. Beautiful. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you, Renata. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lillian, very much. Appreciate it. All right. Talk soon. Yeah. Bye. 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 See you. Thank you.